एक मिनट रुक जाओ रेडी होने दो चलो ये कर लेते हैं हाय आई एम अक्षय हाय दिस इज सौरभ एंड यू आर लिसनिंग टू द फाउंडर थीसिस पॉडकास्ट वी मीट सम ऑफ द मोस्ट सेलिब्रेटेड सार्ट ऑफ फाउंडर्स इन द कंट्री एंड वी वांट टू लर्न हाउ टू बिल्ड अ यूनिकॉर्न I always wanted to learn something and make an impact in real world. Uh, I remember going in Bangalore to all these Kannada speaking brokers and you know half the time they won't really get like what I'm talking about and I was horrible in I think making a pitch as well. My first pitch was you take one third and the other guy take one third and I take one third and they said oh yeah and it was struggle really it was terrible struggle and then other people told me that you get into this business it might be dangerous for you <laughs> you have no idea you you, you may take this one third to your grave first time founders are rarely successful and second time founders are generally successful there is no better example of this than the story of amrish gupta founder of nolarity nolarity is among the biggest saas enterprise out of india with a presence in 65 countries across the globe amrish the boy from kanpur who dreamt of building a successful business is now one of the most celebrated b2b tech startup founders in india here's amrish talking about his life in iit early startup days of nolarity expanding it and finally letting it go and don't forget to subscribe to the show through hdsmartcast.com apple spotify or wherever you get podcasts hi this is ambarish gupta i am the founder of nolarity and the founder ceo of basis factor nolarity is the largest cloud telephony company in asia based in singapore and a lot of customers in the india and middle east basis factor is a private equity firm based in new york and uh, invest in us and canadian businesses as a buyout fund i'd like to start with uh, you growing up in a business family in kanpur to wo bachpan ki kya yaade abhi aapke mind mein strong hai like did you like know ke aapko bhi dhanda karna hai like was that in the blood so to say I I think it was in blood. <laughs> uh, I grew up in a business family, both my mother's side and father's side. Um so everybody is a businessman or businesswoman. You know these jute bags that you use to pack grains, sugar and all those things. We were merchants of that, you know, we were distributed and we were based in Kanpur, which is a small city in UP. And that's what I I I grew up, you know, doing. I have sat on the shop buying 7 rupees gunny bags and and selling at 11. So I understand, you know, what what revenue is, what profit is at a very very early stage of my life. I I was never excited about it. I didn't really find business to be at least that business to be very intellectually exciting. So I was kind of odd man out in my family to want to be a scientist. You know, I remember my family asking me, you know, why do you want to be a scientist or you do a job? You know, there's a saying in Hindi called uttam vidya uh, madhyam dhan ni chakri bhik nidan which basically translates into the best thing is to get education the second is best is to business the uh, second last resort is to do a job and then last resort is to beg <laughs> saying you know why are you moving down on what you want to do in your life but for me intellectual excitement was very important that is how i ended up doing physics i had a stint with uh, bhaba patropic research center bark but i ultimately ended up being in iit kanpur ये तो बार्क स्टेंट यूर सेंग वॉज लाइक वेन यूर इन स्कूल उस टाइम पे आपका बार्क में एक्सपोजर हुआ लाइक बिफोर आई टी कॉन पर या बिफोर आई टी कॉन पर आई मीन दे हैव लाइक ऑल दिस प्रोग्राम वेयर पीपल कैन कम डाउन यू कैन आई थिंक आई I won some kind of scholarship or something, and then they gave me a book and they kind of showed me all the stuff that is available in the atomic research and I kind of what exposed to it I didn't really do anything the I mean the way things happen is your high school your 12th standard and then you kind of trying to figure out like which college you go into I had a lot of interest in science and technology and like IIT was the thing that everybody was looking to get into and I really like JE preparing for it I think it was really nice uh, the exam was very nice and I got in I had a good rank um, and you know if you have good rank you take computer science <laughs> this is how I ended up doing computer science in one of the iits iit kanpur which year 2000 uh, so 96 2000 four years btech how were those four years for you matlab was it like life changing experience 
it was amazing it was amazing the most vivid memories of iit kanpur i mean i was in kanpur it's not bangalore it's it's kind of sleepy town right not not much is happening in kanpur there used to be you know, amazing uh, mills but but those mills kind of died down thanks to various kind of government policies and it's kind of a little bit sad situation really you know you, at least when i was in kanpur iit kanpur is like it's like a gem in the middle of all these disaster um you know you come into iit kanpur as soon as the you cross the gates there is a serenity there is like there's a peacock for them you know there there's kind of people walking around focus on education like almost like harry potter really uh, when you go from kanpur to iit kanpur very nice feeling you know i remember the first time i went to iit kanpur and i think it was something related with j it's been long time i remember there's something called in iit kanpur there's a called uh, faculty building which is where there are a bunch of canteens and you have all these phd's come down to have a chai this very nice and expensive chai and this kind of kind of in the middle of the gardens right um, it's a v- very nice place and i i remember i like, going there and and i glanced that there was a guy and there's a girl uh, sitting there you know guy had a book on his hand and there's a girl on the side and i looked at it and there was like it was like morning right so there was like light 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 sunshine you know shining on them and there was a garden in front and they were sitting on the staircases um and having chai and i said this is perfection this is everything a man needs <laughs> you know the, this is where i need to be um <laughs> the, the, the chai the book the amazing conversation the girl um and the staircases and then nice nature and environment around you it's just amazing really place to be so when you joined iit were you like able to speak in english because i assume school mein zyada english to hoti nahi hogi i i was not actually and for my situation was actually even somewhat different because i went to uh, this is a school called pandit dindal upadhyay sanatan dharm vidyalay which is like not hindi hindi medium it's it's intensely hindi medium like we worshiped a lord uh, hanuman every day for an hour it, it was almost frowned upon to speak in english even though it was very good college considered one of the top two colleges um in up um and we had up state exams so it was very very high quality class but we were not allowed to speak in english um so when i went into iit you know i had a little bit of a problem i wrote english well uh, but i had no experience of the classes where you know somebody is speaking english and trying to explain it first year i struggled a little bit because it's when you're used to teachers is speaking in hindi and you know in pandit uh, dindal upadhyay our teachers were called acharya so your acharya is speaking in hindi versus you jump into you know very americanized um english speaking word of iit kanpur you know i had a little bit of problem but the way i kind of survive was i just studied um, books and i could understand written english much better um and i could write well um as well so you know kind of it just kind of worked out i could imagine many of the people who came from hindi medium school uh, they would have struggled i was not um, alone the whole bunch of people from up and bihar who had come down but everybody kind of survived because it was it was almost i would imagine like roughly probably 30 40% of the people did not really speak um, uh, english or came from english medium school what are the other memories from iit kanpur first year was very intense incredibly intense and disappointing both so when you take je you kind of really understand just of what you are learning in physics and mathematics and and chemistry and one of the greatest experiences of my life have been preparing for je like some of the great theorems that i learned in calculus in you know, thermodynamics in chemistry you know i still remember you know 20 25 years i still remember you know it's just really aha moments of like wow this knowledge for the sake of knowledge you know you learn something but when you go into iit it's not taking a pause and deep diving into things in the first year it is the taking um, a survey of like a very broad area like you just don't want to go deep you just fly through things and that's not my style so for me you know if i get into something i really want to understand it and you kind of flew through many of these things so it was intense because there's so much covered also what ended up happening is in computer science everybody is there, there were 22 people in my class um and everybody had a rank which was less than 100 everybody was intensely intelligent and competitive so what ended up happening is you're used to being smart um, in whatever group you are in and now suddenly you get into a situation we are just like you know everybody is like probably more smart than you so uh, it's a little bit disorienting when you get into iit um especially in that department 
So, you know, I went through a little bit of that dis- disorientation and my regular techniques of like winning were not really not worked out. Many times I would just kind of study and, you know, if I study properly, I would beat everybody else. Here, you, if you study properly, you know, you would be like maybe top one third. <laughs> so it's a, it, it was a little disorientating and getting used to uh, this situation and everybody worked very hard. Overall, amazing memories of first year. Couldn't recreate an IIT. Main motivation of being in IIT, which is the book, the chai, the girl, all sitting on the staircases. But it was amazing experience in first year. So towards fourth year, uh, what what had you become? And you know, what were you thinking of your life after IIT? Um, I became little, I would say, little disillusioned. In the fourth year, or th- by third year, actually, I would say. I loved the group that I was in. It was everybody's incredibly intelligent. They kind of pushed me to think about things in in a next level. And that was a really amazing experience. I think that the peer group is incredibly powerful. What do you call it? They, they are very honest. Like It's extremely meritocratic and that's very honest. You get to see what you're not good at and they'll kind of tell you. And you kind of discover what you like and what you're good at. And in, in this group, if you are good at something, right, you actually you're really good at it. So, for example, I was very good at physics. And I was very good at anything which was visual and theoretical. By by four years of IIT, knew that I was not going to be in academia because while we were doing cutting edge work in IIT, the word outside IIT had like absolutely no impact of all the cutting edge that, that was happening in the campus. There's a village called Nankari. And while we were working on amazing theoretical computer science and stuff in Nankari, you know, people did not have bicycles. I always wanted to learn something and make an impact in real world. And uh, academia didn't really look like that kind of things. I also, in my BTEC thesis, I did something. Which I spent quite a bit of time um, in, in the last year. I knew that as soon as the, the thesis is finished, it will be thrown away. Um, it's, it's no use. So I think those all the research people, you write a research paper and it's kind of just useless. After that, that didn't really go very well with me. I, I think that is the reason I had an option to go do PhD, but I dropped that and I decided to go and see the world. So when I came out of IIT, we were all getting jobs in US. So we got a job. I got a, I took up a job in US as well. But you know, there was some time. So I ended up traveling and, and living in Germany. Uh, as a researcher, worked as a researcher in one of the labs, and kind of that way I kind of saw Europe. As in, uh, tell me, like, which company did you join exactly? And that company sent you to Germany, or did you take up another job? No, so we got a job. So we we were graduating in 2000. We all got a job in 1999 in, in a company, in US company in Valley called Electronics for Imaging. It's like they hired six people, six engineers from computer science department. And we all knew that we'll, we're, we're going to US, um, to the Valley, which is like the Mecca of computer science for everyone. But I, while it was hap- it, it, it was supposed to happen in 2000, October, you know, when we would fly. So I had time. I took up an internship in Germany, a place called Fraunhofer Institute of Computer Graphics. And I said, you know, I'll go see the world, right? So you go live in Germany in, in Fraunhofer Institute of Computer Graphics. I traveled quite extensively. I, so there was three months project internship, which I finished in one month, less than a month. Actually, I, I finished first 20 days. I didn't do anything. Um, after that, 15 days, I finished it. Um, the three months project. Then they challenged me, telling me that, you know, it was a fluke. Um, so I took up another internship and finished in 10 days as well. <laughs> so so they, 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 they remember IIT Kanpur now. And after that, I said, you know what, I'm going to learn German and I'm not going to do more coding. And I traveled. In Germany, what you can do is you can, at the time at least, you know, you, you can do, get something called a weekend pass, uh, which is a pass that you can buy for, I think, $2, $3. And it's meant for students. Um, and then you can take unlimited number of trains of all weekend, but all slow trains. And I wanted to see Germany, so, you know, I would pack stuff with me. And we were not getting much money. We were very poor. So we would kind of go pack stuff. I, I would buy some milk. I'm vegetarian, so buy some milk and um, and some pizza. Um, and um, I would travel in these trains all weekend. And I would sleep on the railway stations, which are very clean. So <laughs> it's just perfectly all right. Uh, that's why I did, you know, we would just leave on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and come back on Sunday. Fascinating experience. Um, Post-Germany, I come back and... The company that was going to send me to US, there was visa was getting delayed, so they gave me an offer to go to Australia. Uh, while visa was for US was getting ready, and I said why not? So I went to Australia and I lived there for a year. Fortunate to travel around Australia, you know, Perth, Melbourne, Sydney. I lived in Sydney, not Sydney for a year, and then went to US. Uh, yeah, I was in US in two thousand one to two thousand three. 
working for EFI, but I didn't really enjoy um, the work here that much because I couldn't see while I was an engineer working on uh, device drivers and embedded system and all those things. You get stuck into kind of a box um, writing code and I've always been the kind of guy who wanted to see the impact of what I did. Um, so if I was not able to see like where my code is getting shipped and what it is doing, it was not enjoyable for me. So 2003, I left US, come back to India to start my first company. I was in Bangalore. I had forty thousand dollars. The idea was very similar to what Housing.com did, which is apartment search on internet. It was actually even before Magic Tricks. That was not a very good time in VC industry in India. You know, there's no there not many VCs. No, there was no ecosystem, or anything. So I kind of just spent my own money to try to launch this company in Bangalore. And um, I remember I first lived in KP Nagar, and then I was living in um, Malishwaram. And you know, it's just kind of tried or a little very painful journey and trying to build a company you know the this no help there's no employee wants to join you co-founder that i kind of came to you to india with kind of changed his mind within a month uh, <laughs> so, you know it doesn't sound right to me you know? <laughs> bye bye you know now you're on, on, on your own um you're already taking this step your co-founder was also with you in u.s yeah, um, so we both decided that we'll come back to India to start this company. And while he was in the, in the plane, he changed his mind. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> we landed. I landed without a co-founder. <laughs> the, the, everything that can go wrong. And then, you know, it's just, it was, now you we know that, you know, you, there's so much ecosystem. You can get help. You know, you have people who have done this before. You can listen to them. Just nothing like that at the time. I remember trying to get an office and spending three months trying to get an office. And what I got, I did not have any idea. So basically, I got a shop floor um, as an office. <laughs> you basically go and sit. It's like absolutely no idea of business. You know, this is this is how you start. Uh, at least I started. We built up a technology very fast. What was your website called? It's called Inventica Solutions. The website was inventicas.com. And we basically were classified for apartment listing. Because when I landed in Bangalore, what I found was like, why is everybody running around? Uh, there were like a whole bunch of brokers, real estate brokers everywhere. So I said, why is everybody running around? Why don't you just put this information, take a picture, put this information on the internet? Um, and then, which is what we did in the US. So, you know, I just copy paste this idea, this will work. But I couldn't execute it. I just, I, I didn't really know anything about building up a business, running the business. Yeah. I spent one and a half years trying to do this. So what did you try to do? You, the product you built yourself, or you had a vendor who built it? and was it... No, no, no. I mean, it's a computer science graduate. You know, of course, you're not going to ask a vendor. This is the only thing that I knew. So I coded it. I went to a university close by and then got a bunch of interns uh, who worked with me for very low pay uh, because I didn't really have money and there was no investment extensively aggressively looking for a co-founder got one of my old friend uh, get interested and kind of worked with me for a few months but he wasn't really wasn't wasn't into it there were three of us in u.s who got disillusioned with being a software engineer in u.s it was me within two years there's another friend of mine named Somidi paul um who actually is in bangalore now running his running company Somidi was not interested so he was also with me the right he can't put science graduate he wanted to become a, a photographer or make movies and wanted to get rid of engineering, like not want to do engineering. And he came back and he traveled almost six, eight months um, all over India and Middle East, uh, India and Southeast Asia, traveling like a hippie. And then he come back um, uh, and then I said, you know what, dude, I need help. Um, <laughs> my co-founder has left, you know, can you join? And he kind of just joined in, but he just joined it for fun. Um, I don't think he had much of a commercial interest. And then third good friend of mine was also an engineer in NVIDIA in, in U.S., and he left and he came back and he wanted to change the political system in India. And uh, his name Pallav, who ended up being my co-founder in Olarity later, he started a political consulting firm using data to drive the political outcome. So um, I was part of this, a little bit part of this group who were willing to take risk to do what we felt was right rather than what everybody was doing. And you already had the real estate listing site idea in US or you came to India with an idea that you had to and then... My my I don't know my idea was different. Um, so I had come to India with the idea of um, which is also got which was quite ahead of time, which was 
you know, why do people have to line up to get train tickets, um, various kind of tickets, people buy movie tickets and all those tickets. So we had created an ATM kind of machine, um, a kiosk where you can, uh, and everybody had phone at that time. So I was, people were getting phone or SMS. So the idea was you can buy a um, ticket uh, over phone and then you will be sent out a OTP kind of thing or some kind of code that you can punch in in the kiosk and you'll get the ticket. So you don't have to stand in the line in, in the movie theaters and so what given that I I was interested in embedded systems and device drivers and those things. So I created the kiosk. Right? I remember doing all this research and building up the kiosk. And I came to India with a kiosk that I will get this kiosk installed in various places. Um, but um, by the time I landed, my co-founder changed, had a change of heart. And um, while kiosk idea was there, and I stayed with a friend for, for two months. And while I was staying with a friend, I was looking for like where to stay, uh, where to rent and stay. And, and I said, wow, <laughs> rental place is so difficult. Um, so, I mean, why just have a website where, so, and this looks easier idea to me uh, than installing kiosk in railway stations and, and movie theaters. So I thought, well, let's just pursue this, even that anyway, my co-founder is gone there. So I started executing this. So what was the problem? Like listings didn't get listings or the users didn't come to look at listings? <laughs> so I, I mean the business model was bad it was not the model of it's going to be a website and we'll get the listing and people come the idea there was that the real estate brokers have properties but they don't have customers right and the customers need property uh, that they want to get but you know the guy that they're chatting with you know may not be the guy who has that property that they're looking for so if we create some kind of broker network, which is actually what Pallav has done, which is the so one broker has customer, another broker has property. And then if they sh- kind of share the customer and property, the deal happens. And what we wanted was broker makes some money, the customer broker makes some money, and real, real estate broker makes some money, uh, the property broker makes some money, and we get some cut in the middle. So what we needed to do in this case was go and talk with the brokers and convince them that it should become part of this broker network. And uh, I remember going in Bangalore to all these cutter eye speaking brokers and you know, half the time they won't really get like what I'm talking about. And I was horrible in, I think, making a pitch as well. My first pitch was, you take one third and the other guy take one third and I take one third. And they said, oh yeah. <laughs> and it was struggle really, you know, it's, it's a, it was terrible struggle. I remember I had a bike. Going from point A to point B um, in Bangalore, it's, it's kind of just nice at the time. You know, it was not as traffic as it is today. It was it's a life very much on the edge, right? It was no income, did not know anybody in Bangalore. This was the first time I was in Bangalore. Just no employees, no investors, no advice, going to real estate brokers and giving them a pitch, which really was not working. And then other people told me that you get into this business, it might be dangerous for you. <laughs> you have no idea. You, you may, you may take this one third to your grave. <laughs> so, and uh, I think there's another thing, you know, when I came back to India, I wanted to kind of give myself one and a half years, two years kind of time period. The plan B was also I'll go do in an MBA. And um, and if it doesn't work out, go to MBA with some experience in business. And that was always at the back of my mind. You You had an escape option, basically. Yeah, you had an escape option. So you don't go to war with your boats in the back. You have to burn your boat. I didn't burn my boats. It was like fun stuff. Like this is a kind of a resorty stuff. And you know, out of college, uh, you immediately went out of India to all these countries. And then you kind of not really feel connected to the country. You kind of missed out of what the real India is. IIT Kanpur was anywhere, every tower, right? Before that, you're sitting in, um, your parents are taking care of you. So you can never really experience India, India as an adult. This was me experiencing India, India as an adult. I would say that is how it was really for me. I would say overwhelming reason would be like there was no support system and, you know, I did not know anything about business. But I would say 10, 20% would be, maybe I didn't really care that much either. You know, I had an, I had an escape route. So you had no money, then you took a loan to do your MBA? Because you would have spent your money on this business, no? We got a scholarship. Um, so I cracked GMAT quite well. I went to CMU. So I also got married. I was dating my wife at the time. In Bangalore? In in US. So my wife was Chinese. I got married in, in India uh, and I had a court marriage. CMU gave scholarship and a whole bunch of support. The whole reason for me to getting into MBA school was I was meeting a lot of VCs, uh, actually a few VCs, not a lot, two, three VCs who would not do anything less than $5 million. Um, so 
but I quite like the VC job. I thought, well, oh, this is cool because you're kind of close to, this is safe. <laughs> you don't get pushed around like the way my one last one and a half years of experience, close to kind of exciting stuff, which is using technology to make real world impact. So I remember he telling me, you know, well, but you don't have business experience. I said, well, what better business experience you want than, you know, somebody who's struggling <laughs> on the streets of Bangalore? He said, no, you, know, you, need, you need proper business experience. Why don't you have an MBA? So I said, okay. So that was actually my idea to get an MBA was to get into VC. And while I was in CMU, I realized, well, VC invests a little money, four, five million dollars, ten million dollars. There's something called P, uh, where you invest hundreds of million dollars. So, you know, if you're in the business of making a large scale impact with what you've learned, why not get into P? So move towards P. When you try to get into P, you either get a total financial analyst or you get some operating experience. But there's a route from McKinsey. So, you know, I thought I should go into McKinsey first and spend two, three years there and then go into P. You had a small stint at uh, Booz Allen Hamilton also, no? Before McKinsey. Yeah, so I mean, Booz, I mean, you do internships. Yeah, so that was Booz Allen and then, then two years with McKinsey. And that was like amazing education um, on business. And I, I think very fond memories of that uh, two plus two years. I had a lot of interest in macroeconomics, for example, the currency theories, the negotiations, you know, the, the organization theories. It was very intellectually very exciting and it was very real because the people who taught were literally the people who were doing stuff as well. So, so McKinsey was like strategy consulting kind of a role. Yeah, so McKinsey, I did strategy consulting, Fortune 50 companies. Literally, you advise the CEOs on transformation of uh, their businesses. And um, I work with bank and insurance firm. So you're literally advising 2007, 2009 time was, you know, the recession era, the, the banks and insurance firms were a little bit struggling. Many times they would invite McKinsey to come and do the analysis to number one, see where they are. Uh, and number two, to have them get out of uh, this very difficult time. So, you know, as part, would be part of the team, I'm very interested work very very intense work you know i think mckinsey was incredibly intense work i, I would say mckinsey were more intense for me than no um in terms of working hours you know the 14 hours 12 hours you know absolutely left right and center with it i remember being on the phone call from the hotel room and dozing off during the phone call and she was so tired not leaving my hotel room for seven days because you know you're part of a very intense due diligence after seven days realizing that there is a window in the room because did not realize there is a window in the room you don't let I remember not letting the, the hotel guys to kind of come in not changing the bed sheet because it would disturb you so you know it's the same bed sheet seven days just eat and then somebody comes picks up the, the food and just focus on work 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 uh, 15 hours a day extremely exciting that exposed to a lot of industries um, and the US is very fast paced I would say uh, surrounded by very intelligent and very hard working people um, so I think CMU was a really a cakewalk for me <laughs> it was it was very easy but McKinsey was um, intense. Uh, the, in McKinsey, not only people were smart, they worked also very hard. So by the end of two years, did you get like burnt out and wanted to move on or what happened? It, it was a little burnt out as well. I mean, I always wanted to be in private equity and do something which is not just consulting advice, but beyond. Um, for me, that was a stepping step to do something else. I could not see myself as a management consultant because management consultant is just advice. Advice is, is up to the client to take it. I think one theme that you'll see is that I want to make an impact. I want to do it. I, I tried to get into private equity at that time, but, you know, banking sector was not doing very well. So I decided, you know what, let's go back and try to start another company. <laughs> Me, uh, that's how Nolarity got started. So your, your wife was okay with it? Because, I, I mean, she wouldn't have found India as comfortable as US, no doubt. See, I mean, she was okay. Uh, she was very supportive. What ended up happening was that you no know, with my first experience that I knew that startups fail 90% of the time I had, I had imagined that this will fail as well so I had a full plan that when it will fail what will I do when it will fail so I have 2-3 years of experience when I'm struggling and then by the time what economy will be better and I'll come back you know and do something in private equity yeah and then with this I have more you know real experience I had not planned for it to succeed <laughs> so because I mean logically speaking that was the right plan but it was like if it works out then something will work out right around it it worked out when you came to India, did you have a business in mind that this is what I want to do? Yeah, no, no, it was all clear. Uh, this time I didn't really make the mistake of the first time. Uh, I learned from the first mistakes. When in McKinsey, we use something called eFax, which is fax to email service. Fax to email is you send fax, you get an email, basically a PDF document. I look at the income statement. It's a publicly traded company and it's a 30% EBITDA. From a strategic point of view, commodity product like this, which is a very simple commodity product, you shouldn't really have such a high EBITDA. 
uh, I was very surprised. And then I dug in and then I found out the reason it is a high beta is because phone numbers are very sticky. Once you buy a phone number, which is a fax number, you know, you don't change it even if it's like three, four dollars more per year, per month. For example, they were selling at 12, the company was selling at nine dollars per, per month. And, you know, would you change your phone number to save three dollars? No, you know. So, so I said, wow, that's pretty cool. You know, and this is a high gross margin, it's like 80% gross margin business. So it's the 80% gross margin, high recurring revenue business. And India didn't have it. <laughs> I said, okay, no product market risk, uh, high gross margins, high level of profitability. And we have a precedence of somebody already doing it. So let's launch equivalent in India. And we call it Superfax. Um, this is how Super Reception, by the way, started. So we launched Superfax. And it was very easy to do because I was, I literally coded it in like, you know, a few days, this whole thing. And um, it worked. And I said, okay, we are in the business. Um, so we took telephone line in India and I partnered with my partner, you know, Palla, who was already running a business. So second mistake, don't get somebody who is kind of you know is also working with you i got a guy who kind of who has perseverance to, to stick on for three four years um running his own political consulting and he was kind of getting disillusioned with political consulting he became a partner and i was still sitting in u.s while we launched the company so i was very careful this time um and uh, the company started super fact didn't really take off because facts was a dying industry and nobody wanted to touch while this was happening there was this election was happening in orissa and uh, they needed to make phone calls which was a very new technology. Fellow is a great salesman. He went around and sold his idea. The chief minister at the time, I think it was Naveen Patnaik. Um, and uh, he was like a new age guy. And we got an order and cash uh, from them. It was like start with a bang, right? It was a, almost a pro rupees order. We changed our technology, which sent fax <laughs> to send, start making phone calls. And we executed this order and we made some money. And then we kind of got hooked into it. And e-fax also had e-voice, which is for inbound IVR. So I knew that I am not going into uncharted territory. You know, we are doing something that, you know, others have done and proven it. Uh, to have built a great business. So it kind of went into that direction, e-voice, and then fax was dismantled, and we boosted that money to build up a platform, uh, Nolatis, so first platform, Nolas 1.0. Um, and uh, we hired a bunch of people from IIT Guwahati. Why did you call it Nolarity? Where does the name come from? It's cool. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a combination of two terms called knowledge and singularity. Um, so there's the whole idea. You know, if you have you seen Terminator movies? Yeah, 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 yeah. The singularity is when AI becomes as intelligent as a human. Yeah, so I'm, so I'm, I, I have always been interested in AI in IIT. I was doing natural language processing in 1999. I want to see technology doing something real, right? And what is more real than AI, right? AI and robotics. And I did natural language processing. And basically, natural language processing in 1999 didn't really work. Uh, is because uh, the computers are very slow and the algorithms and data were not available. There were a whole bunch of problems. Right? So I left it and moved to a system. But, you know, AI, the idea that there will be a time when you can have intelligence, which is general intelligence, similar level as um, human being. And given that software can be replicated very fast and they can improve themselves. So what you end up happening is, you know, if you have general level of intelligence um, in AI, you can have them program to improve themselves and that means they become smarter than human being and and then they are programming themselves to become even smarter. so you have exponential growth in terms of intelligence happen and that's what's called singularity knowledge singularity you know at that moment um you know one day you will have in the power of ai and uh, that is what is called knowledge singularity because that that ai will know everything you know all the data anyways it's a consumable digital format now it can read everything and it can store everything for intelligence and, and just been fascinated by that idea of knowledge singularity and that's how nolarity's name is knowledge singularity me and swamideep who was my first co-founder uh, in my previous company we chatted on google chat while we were coming up with a name and we come up with a name in like seven minutes and the chat is still, I published the chat on a blog post. I said, no Larity. And he said, you know, doesn't look good. But then we kind of look at other option and they said, oh, no Larity looks good. Let's do no Larity. And, so, and then, so I became no Larity. And then my platform became Nolas and, you know, employees become no Laritarians and, you know, everything, you know, it started from there. You realize how accidental these things are. You look back and you say, there was no thought. I think, I don't know why people, people to go back and kind of build up some kind of, I always knew this kind of story. It's all accidental right you're kind of bouncing from one place to another place just trying to live life as honestly as possible and just think these things just happen so uh, i want to understand better on how you uh, technologically improved what was existing before then like i remember uh, an ivr meant that you have a airtel or some somebody installing a line in your office and uh, that line probably Airtel or somebody programs it. So it has to be physically there. So how, how did you 
innovate on that and you know can you tell me a bit about that like from the technology standpoint what was the innovation that you got in and were there other people doing the same stuff at that time nobody was doing it um, the way technology work at that time was you installed a box in your premise you installed a software so you took telephone lines and you installed a box with a software attached to it um so when the call came you know it will go into a box and it will play the ivr but the problem with that was and this is and the us also had gone through that that kind of journey um the problem with that was you have to take a telephone line from deltel and, and reliance and all of these guys and you have to go buy a box and you have to make sure the box is always up and there's all calls enter line so it was very error prone very ex- very difficult technology really 2009 also was the year that the emerging markets started providing more to the world growth than developed market and for me to move from new york to new, to new delhi it was very strategic in the sense that i felt that emerging markets were the future and i had as an indian sitting in us i had an advantage being in india and you know being able to operate there uh, because i really understood that market you know that's kind of a high level idea also the technologies which worked in the emerging markets were all cloud because cloud is cheaper much much cheaper you know you buy a box which is $5000 versus you pay $200 per month right? uh, it's a pay as you go model um, so you don't have you no know, no businessman in india have money to invest in kind of big boxes pay as you go saas model worked um, for very cost conscious indian businesses the focus on providing service you know if you're getting paid if the if the provider is getting paid you know every month you know they have to make sure the services are high quality versus you sell a box and disappear so you know, it's i kind of aligns the provider's interest as well uh, it's cheaper almost one ton the cost you know everything cheap in india works right because people don't have money so you want to if you want to bring technology which has a huge impact on productivity but it's a lower cost so telecom was growing 100% year on year at the time but at a very strategic level if you think about it there is something called derivative market theory derivative market theory basically says that as soon as you have a market any one market kind of comes in because of that market comes in the other derivative market that come in i'll give some examples right so for example it comes from the fact that you know if you have a hammer everything looks like a nail right and that's another example if you have a car you will drive and if you drive look at your credit card statement you'll start spending more money on dhabas rather than you know neighborhood restaurant in second a post second world war the during second world world war everybody had to win so everybody spent loads and loads of money on um, various kind of uh, weapon and uh, and war machinery right so tanks became very good during second world war um, the missile technology became massively improved in second world war the people developed the organization theories around how to do very fast uh, manufacturing you know all those things because if you did not know you will be you know you'll be looted by the other country right so you it was a do or die kind of situation so there's like loads of technological development happened during second world war one of which was you know tank technology became very robust and very good and volkswagen for example you know which is you know german car manufacturer which volkswagen the german name is people's car it was actually nazi germany's tank manufacturer uh, they, they they made tanks so they used this technology to put in the cars and it was much improved technology it's kind of you know more efficient you know more power and all those things you know, america one and you know russia one it came from Up, right um they took up the technology <laughs> and took the scientists and engineers with them um and that is how by by the way america's moon mission you kind of quite a bit of help talent help from the folks who were sending missiles the outcome of the tank technology was the people had cars and car which could go a long distance uh, without breaking down the cars means that people did not have to live in downtown they can live in suburb uh, far away from the city. So suburb kind of come into the play suburb means that you know, your white pickets and you know the all the nice things around the suburbs you know all those technologies started developing so if you give every indian a mobile phone in their hand what are they going to do they're going to call <laughs> um and um my thesis was they're going to call business earlier they couldn't reach out to business you know you never call colgate or pepsi whoever right in india because how would you reach out to the business right you know you could only reach out to business which is you can physically visit but if somebody is sitting in delhi you are in kanpur you cannot visit them but if you have a phone you're going to call them so what i expected was consumer to business phone calls will skyrocket right if everybody every consumer have phone and that's what ended up happening but business were receiving phone calls suddenly last year they were receiving like you know 100 calls per month today they, they are receiving 1000 calls per month so how do you manage these phone calls as soon as complexity go up you need a business phone system to manage you know call routing recording logs analytics and all the good stuff that business needs and india didn't really have any business telephony in india got consumer telephony but no business telephony so my thesis was given consumer telephony has happened business telephony will happen right and i am the one who will do it and that's how nullity you know the thesis was born also my first company was consumer um and consumer are very high risk b2b companies are low risk because you ask money from people upfront 
And one 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 big thing that I believe is that if you ask money from people, they'll tell you the truth. So for example, if if I you know come and give you my product, you know, hey, say, say, actually, you know, do you want to give it a try? This is an amazing project. We say, yeah, it looks good. You know, it's very nice. Thank you, Amrish. Right. But if I come and tell you, actually, I can use this product, but I'll charge you like hundred dollar per month, and you know, I need twelve months in advance. You look at it and say, dude. No, it's not hundred dollar worth per month product. <laughs> what I what do you have built up? <laughs> Go away. You know, I'll pay five dollars. No, no, maybe not five dollars. Because of which B two B companies fail quickly because you know you go tell you get truth and then either you fix it or you don't fix it and that way you get the signals very quickly on whether this is going to work or not work. So this time my idea was I'll do B two B. It's boring. It's much more spend a lot more time building up the company, but it's a lower risk. And I was ready for lower risk situation. I wanted to reduce my risk. Every I did everything possible to mitigate my risk this time because of my first experience. You got a partner who was you know already running a company, so you know you don't have a partner who has a problem of kind of changing his mind halfway. Get into industry which was growing very fast, rising tide raises all the boats, right? So you know what is going up. You know hopefully things will be good. Not taking product market risk, quote unquote, inspired by Ring Center and e-voice right uh, to do it in indian market very nice moat indian pst and voip laws meant that you know you could not get into geographies uh, using voip so all the ring central e-voice use voice technologies evo you know voip technology which was not allowed in india so we built up a new kind of technology and technology i could write you know, i understood computer science very well that we could solve but that also meant that our stack was very different from them they couldn't get into us you know indian market and they have still it's been 10 years they have not been able to get into indian market so you know from that very very safe company uh I started. I raised half, you know, quarter million dollar from a bunch of friends. So I was not dependent on my own savings, which you know, which was another reason that I stopped last time. Um, so everything that that went wrong last time, I kind of corrected it, and uh, and that is how this company got started. Um, yeah, we we got very good response. By 2011, we were seeing that product market fit start happening. A lot of people wanted our product. We started doing. Uh, before uh, so before 11 so 2009 mid of 9 you started this uh, so when did you get your first sale how long did it take you to build the product and reach first sale we started with the sale right this navin patnaik thing happened in even before the company started actually 2000 may so we made the money before the company was incorporated so as, soon as that sale happened you kind of like scrambled to write the code and build the product very quickly so that you can execute Actually, the sale, yeah. So sale happened before product was made. After that, me and Pallav spent seventy-two hours straight writing the code. Um, I did not sleep for seventy-two hours. Red Bull and whiskey. Uh, that that <laughs> that can keep you awake for seventy-two hours. So we wrote in Perl, Perl, and I remember writing it. Um, and it was very weirdly written, very very weirdly written code and uh, structure, but it worked. So can you tell me, like, cloud telephony? What is it? मतलब वो एक नंबर में कॉल गया एंड फिर वो आगे किसी और को पहुंच गया वो कैसे होता है लाइक व्हाट इज द कोड दैट यू रोट हाउ मेनी फंडामेंटल टेक्नोलॉजी इज योर फ्रेंड कॉल्स यू ऑन योर सेल फोन राइट एंड यू से वेट वेट रुक जाओ एंड देन यू वांट टू टॉक विद अनदर फ्रेंड यू कॉल अनदर गाय एंड ब्रिज बोथ ऑफ देम ऑन योर फोन एग्जैक्टली व्हाट दिस व्हाट यू डू लाइक यू अनदर गाय एंड नाउ मिस्टर ए हु हैव कॉल्ड यू um you and mr b you who you called are all in the same call right so cloud tele- that's what cloud telephony is fundamentally you know your call comes and then your ivrs uh, technology looks up into database to find out you know who should the call the call should be forwarded to connected to and from another telephone line you make a phone call to that person and in the software you bridge the phone call, these two connections how does software bridge the two connections because like my phone is like a piece of hardware which is doing the conferencing in your phone on your cell phone it's not the hardware which is bridging the connection it's a software that's bridging the connection it's a, it's, a, it's basically merging two mp3 streams okay so uh, after the navin patnaik and then you spent 72 hours to build it then when when did the next sale happen after that So now in part time we made good money you know, roughly 1.5 crore rupees and then after that we said you know how about we just give it to everyone so we built up a reseller network by the end of 2009 we had so much sale that our system was crashing like every second day you know we were in the outbound call business and i remember that at the time the price was 45 paisa for a pulse we buy it and you know, we were buying at 39 we were selling at 45 paisa per per 30 second and there was no margins for during diwali and holidays everybody election everybody wanted to use our system and and um, other times nobody wanted it most of the time nobody was using it and sometime everybody wanted we had to take telephone line and maintain the system so it, there was a cost associated with it so what we realized was this was not a good business we need to move from outbound to inbound which was just recurring which was you know once you take a phone number you don't want to change it but it was high ghost margin because incoming calls were free 
So we sometime 2010 early we start thinking about it, uh, but really launch is in 2011. You're making money all along 2010, but it was mostly outbound business. You know, the inbound business started in 2011. And when did you do your first fundraise? Whether well, one thing you did friends and family round before starting only, but like a formal fundraise. 2009 was the first fundraise, friends and family, and then 2011 was another friends and family round. And it was all convertible debt, you know, which was, I think, probably one of the first company in India to do convertible debt. 2012, January is when we raised money from Sequoia. So how easy or difficult was that, like getting Sequoia to invest? It was, I think we were a little bit lucky. Uh, our thesis was very similar to Ring Center. Sequoia had made good money in Ring Center in US. From that point of view, they said, okay, well, Ring Center kind of business in India, you know, makes sense. So I think that kind of played out. We also had quite a bit of traction. We had 500 customers by that time who were paying. Um, we had 50 people team. Um, so we were kind of reasonable scale by that time. For the backgrounds, I had understood both technology and business. Pallav was um, the IITE graduate and and, um, quite a bit of entrepreneurial experience as well. So it was kind of a pretty good team, really, um, to start. Why did you decide to raise funds when you were, like, you told me that you were, like, cash flow positive, you were not burning. So why the need to raise funds? No, we were not cash flow positive. I mean, in the beginning, we were cash flow positive, but then we the we started out by making money. But, um, but very quickly, we said we do things properly. You know, that is where you hire engineers and, and build up systems. And then, you know, that was one-time sale and, you know, it dried out. So your, your revenue dropped and your um, your costs go up so we were unprofitable and there was really it, the interest really never was to make money really in this business for me it was making an impact and proving a point I, you know I wanted to build up the company in a VC backed way so that there is a capital so that never be constrained in terms of fulfilling the dream of building up a great business out of India so uh, post Sequoia fundraise then uh, what happened after that Sequo fundraise happened when, when the VCs come, the dynamics change a little bit as well. Um, so now there's like one more person who has a certain way of looking at the world for better or for a worse. Um, so I think you kind of a little bit adjust to that dynamics as well. And we, we grew. We grew quite well. We had a little bit of a hiccup in 2012 in the first half, I remember. But after that, we grew. We grew steadily post that. Did very, very well in 2012, 13, then 14. We raised Series B from Mayfield and Sequoia combined. Pallav left around 2013. But Pallav, I think, was more early stage person. But, you know, the dynamics in early stage in a company are a little bit different where you're kind of making decisions very, very quickly changing things and all those things versus a little bit later stage where dynamics are very process oriented you know way of looking at the world and i think he was not enjoying it as much this change in dynamics especially after uh, the funding happened so you know it's a it's, it's a very amicable you know the he, he maintained all his equity as well and then i got one of my friends to come and join become a ceo in the company uh, to take the company forward you know and, and then it worked so uh, what what was the revenue trajectory like 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 when you raised from sequoia what what was the revenue that year and then by the time you left what had the revenue become you know how did it evolve over the years i can't tell you that numbers <laughs> especially now that i'm out also but you know i remember between sequoia coming in and around the time i'm leaving we grew 60x and became profitable as well. So I would say six years, 12 to 18, pretty incredible journey, you know, a real business, which is EBITDA and cash flow profitable. Currently, no it doesn't need cash from anyone. It produces cash. Massive growth, massive growth. 60x growth in six years is um, extremely rapid. What was the reason for the growth? Like, you know, what's the secret behind it? I mean, I mean it's like it was successful business. It was the right place, right time the right technology right pricing support from our investors uh very hard work from the employees and we grew from 50 people to 400 people was it largely like inbound sales like you know inbound inquiries uh, based or was it we did, we did both inbound and outbound we pretty much created this market we had to educate the market and we educated market I mean, one of the reasons that you see me i'm somewhat private person but uh, for nullity i ended up being very public person when I was uh, founder running the business as CEO, we had a lot of press and uh, we got involved in a whole bunch of things and I was very vocal and uh, talked a lot as well. 
and PR for us was one way to kind of have people know that we exist, not in the startup world, but in kind of general business ecosystem. And that worked very well. When people got to know that there's, there's a technology which can do so many interesting stuff, allow you to connect with your customers over communications, over phone and all those things. And this was really the only communication method available to communicate with your customers. We, we use this mechanism to have people get educated in a very inexpensive way. The people reach out to us and many times our sales team, we had 300 people sales team, 400 channel partners. Cloud telephony, we pretty much <laughs> educated India uh, on what cloud telephony can do and wherever cloud telephony currently is. When did you decide to go global beyond India? It was right from the beginning. I mean, I didn't really want to build up an Indian company. I wanted to build up um, a global company which is serving, which would serve Middle Eastern and South Asian market as well, uh, all the emerging markets. And uh, our technology was well suited for those markets. Um, from India, we became a Singaporean entity sometime in 2013. So you can see very early, we wanted to be a Singaporean company because that way we would service Southeast Asian and Middle Eastern market from Singapore holding company rather than sitting in India, uh, where you end up having a lot of friction in, in managing many of these things. You shifted base to Singapore or that was just like a... It was holding company. You know, most of business was still in India, so I mostly stayed in India. What was the split between India and uh, outside India? Like by the time you left, what, what percentage was India? I mean, it's still majority came from outside India, but very significant minority came from outside India by the time I was leaving. So the the going global expansion was again funded through the Series B and further that you did because I imagine that would have been expensive to open up offices outside and get the sales cycle running. Yeah, I mean, it was expensive. It took very long time to kind of just go through the process and making sure that we ticked all the tick marks, you know, as when we launched in Dubai, for example, or Philippines or Thailand, many of these countries. You're in a business where there, there is some part which is kind of stable and running steadily. And then there's some part which is outside market, which is kind of you're doing experiments. So you kind of have to balance out by doing experiments and, and, and running a proper business as well. They're not, there should not be all experiments because then you don't know what is going to work on. You kind of just keep burning money. And it should not be all boring, just kind of regular business because then it's not good either. So uh, 2018, you decided to move out of nullarity. What prompted that? It's, it was a long time, really. Very, very long time time you know if i wanted to do business i would have be doing business you know selling jute bags <laughs> in in kanpur right um, i am not you know that kind of person you want to build something which makes an impact but you know once it is kind of self sustaining and kind of doing things by yourself why would you just sit there and, and waste the time um, also when the companies get big they do not want too many changes like you think to be very stable so you want less change and i am not i am not i am a change agent and there are a whole bunch of other ideas that I have because of which basic sector started. Okay, so how did you handle the transition? Like, did you find your own replacement or, you know, how did that happen? Because, I mean, you are the CEO and founder and for you to leave also, I mean, from a PR angle also would have been risky and, you know, so how did you manage that? I mean, this happens all the time, pretty much a little bit given uh, and you know it's kind of both side really many cases it doesn't happen many cases you know but most of the cases most of the time it happens it's just the work become very different from you know what you were doing um, when you started off the company and, and building up the company from pr point of view it's not a big deal yeah, everybody's seen is you know this done and dusted situation in terms of hiring it's exactly the same you hire people and get them not as a CEO position, maybe some other position and give them a try. If it works, then you kind of just inch them forward to kind of give them more power. That's how it works. Um, so you want to make it a gradual process. So uh, is basis vectors a, a way to return to your original dream of being in a PE? <laughs> yeah, well, so I mean, originally I wanted to work in a PE. Now I'm running a PE. Um, I would say I always believe in that thesis. The in, in a PE form, you can make much larger impact. It's a you know you have multiple CEOs now and you know, are working in the portfolio company. It's a much larger impact uh, that you can make. It's less operational than what Nolarity, for example, running your own business. And it's kind of a very natural stepping stone, really, for me. It's a little bit going back what I was planning to do um, as well. So, how did you get Basis Vector off the ground? <laughs> I think I now I have so much credibility. I am one of the few people in the world who have run low-cost, large-scale SaaS companies. I mean, the first time was starting companies difficult. Now you are like a proven thesis. So <laughs> it's a lot less difficult. Tell me a bit more on how it operates. Like how does a PE or a VC fund operate? Like 
you find uh, HNIs and uh, institutional investors who will give you money and let you invest it for them? And like, how does that whole process happen? Yeah, it was something like this, you know, you know, exactly. So, you know, initially you'll find people who you already knew and then you take their money and then you find people who have bigger chunk of money, right? You have to have some investment experience as well that you can demonstrate. Uh, whatever thesis that you have, I have so much operating experience. Most of the VCs, especially in India, don't know, don't have any operating experience. What end up happening is that uh, these people, when they sit in front of LP, they somehow be able to answer the question of how they will be able to demonstrate be able to make a good investment um, is by showing the investment prowess. For me, the thesis end up being very different. When I sit in front of somebody with money, I can tell that, you know, I'm going to get very much involved and see, look what I built. Spend a, you know, spend a decade doing it and everybody knows this and you can go and check. Um, so, and most of the time they already know. So otherwise, we wouldn't even have a conversation. They know that this guy understands what he's talking about deeply. And then I understand. So McKinsey US is, um, is a big brand and it's a kind of big stamp in terms of you know, understand business in general and investment world in general. So it's kind of just combine these two. And um, out of five, ten, you know, somebody will give you money. And there's a lot of money in the world. Uh, so it's a chasing the right places to get invested. You as a capital allocator, you know, helping facilitate that. It's not It's not like you're begging anything. You're basically providing a service. They, they need to get return on their money for their investors or their also fund managers and they do not know how to make their seven eight percent you know you go there and then and make it possible for them so as an angel investor what are some of the companies you backed in india and what was the reason to back those companies like no i mean i've done, done a bunch of angel investments but um, not done and not not planning to do so uh, what makes you invest in a company? Is it like the uh, recommendation matters a lot or is it like you're impressed by the team or do you look at the market size that they're addressing? Or... These are all B2B SaaS companies. Uh, they come to me. I knew through some network and um, I just gave them some of my personal money. Um, so there's a company called Infido. There's a company called Easycom, HireXP, Sunstone Business School. Um, these are a few examples of the companies that, that, that I invested in. Team, thesis, market size, you know, all those things. The way I would think about, um, you know, starting my own business, you know, you would look about, you look at whether there is the team will push through or not. Do they have all the complementary skill set? I am not an angel investor believer. From a commercial reason point of view, the angels are called angels because it's a money down the drain. <laughs> That's why they call angels, right? You know, they should not expect any return. People do angel investment because of fun. Angel doesn't have a thesis. There's, there's no method to madness around angel investment. You meet a guy, you say, oh, I like this guy. He's doing something. I want to stay connected. Here's someone. Angel investment as an investment vehicle the, the only thesis that works is spray and pray. Um, that's not something exciting really. There's no intellectual excitement in, in spray and pray. What does it take to be a founder of a startup that scales up well? Is it like just being lucky or is there a science behind it? And, you know, are, are you able to spot, okay, he's a founder who will scale up a startup? I think before you become a founder, you have to be a good leader. And before you are a good leader, you have to be a good human being. And before you become a good human being, you have to know who you are. So there's a little bit of judge. Otherwise, loads of bullshit. Lot amount of bullshit is floating around. Why do people want to be founders? How come just 10 years back, nobody wanted to be founders? How come what, what has happened just now? It's because people are watching on TV, on the newspaper, youngish people getting loads of money and fame. And they're saying, oh, this sounds cool. I should do it as well. That's the worst possible reason to want to be a founder but that's what 90% of people are doing it's just cool thing the way it was in it was cool thing to go to US and get a green card in US uh, just 20 years back or become an engineer or doctor was a cool thing and then there was a consulting was a cool thing uh, the problem is that you know if you don't intrinsically like what you're doing you're not going to be very good at it and um, in other jobs you know you can be not very good at something and you can still survive if you're a founder where everything is already index already stacked against you like so high, not enjoying it or not being very good at it is a death knell. It will kill you.
only source of happiness when you are running a company or when you are founder if you end up kind of raising investment and you know unlikely chances of raising investment and growing is going to be your own sense of internal satisfaction that you are doing what you like to do right that's only source of happiness and if that is also not there you did it because your buddy who you know who raised investment from somebody else and look how cool he looks that's why i'm doing it you you're not going to succeed because you'll not be able to pull 15 hours you'll burn out very quickly you know you will not do everybody's dirty laundry this is uh, unfortunately a lot of people don't want to hear this this is a hard path figuring out yourself and people can smell confidence or lack of confidence as a leader right you want people to come and work for you uh, at half the cost half half the pay and then hope something will happen you know people who you want you want to go to angel investors or investors and give you money uh, you want to go to customers and give them your half baked product and then they want you know they should buy your product well, good luck you know you have to have confidence and the confidence comes from knowing yourself what you want to do and what you will take the bullet for you are your 18 20 year old you graduate from the college you never made a decision in your life you know you've always followed what your parents said or you know your your peer group said so you never you can't have confidence until you try out things and fail there are people of course right who in the college they have made their own decisions and they are very self aware and then they kind of doing things their own way the i think this path of you know knowing what you want having the confidence and then once you have a confidence you are quite comfortable failing you know screw it you know i'll, I'll fail i'll try it again because anyway there's nothing else that i want to do so i'll just do it you maybe you'll fail maybe you'll succeed right but at least you can execute if you don't have that it's difficult in the first couple of years of nolarity how hard did you work like did was it like mckinsey hard with you know like 12 hour 15 hour days or did you have better work life balance i at number one i hate the term work life balance you know um because the work life balance term presumes that you don't like your work so it's like if i ask you um hey you know uh, the, the akshay i'll give you gold and i'll give you silver right so uh will you want to balance out like how much gold you have and how much silver you or you'll have all gold so as you come in akshay comes a smart guy he takes like i, I said you can take 100 kilograms of gold and silver in whatever proportion you come back and you say you know what i am taking take 100 kilogram of gold i said akshay what kind of stupid person are you you did not do silver gold balance right <laughs> so <laughs> you'll say you what you will say is that well i don't want balance i want all gold right why would i want to have silver right in the same way it's a work life balance you know if If you are doing what you're liking to do, but what you really want to do, um, why would you? I can understand you, you need biological need. You need to eat. You need to do other things, and then you need to sleep, right? I can understand those things because otherwise you cannot work. Also, it, it's not like I'm not saying that you should not have it. I'm saying that if you want it, that means what you're doing is not what you wanted to do. So please stop it and do something else. Yeah. So, um, so I think work-life balance to to your question on nullities. You know, for six months we had all engineers sleep in. in the office we did not have night off and it smelled it smelled very bad and i mean even you were sleeping there was it yeah yeah you would have like 3 o'clock meetings conversations you know all those kind of things happen you know we, we were very intense when we started out um i i was doing some project with um, microsoft at the time so um, i literally had like 4 hours sleep at the time i was working 20 hours a day in the morning we needed money as well so in the morning i'll work for microsoft and the rest of the 12 hours i would work on nullity idea and then i was in us in seattle the team was in india so i would stay up all night and then daytime i would go to work you know a founder if there is a founder who is unwilling to put in this level of hard work and effort uh, for whatever reason should that person even think of becoming a founder i mean what is the meaning of becoming a founder what is the meaning of becoming becoming founder means what you want to start a company correct right? i mean that's the, what i understand now um starting a company there are various intensity level of the companies that you can start the question that you should ask is why are you wanting to start a company what, what is the reason you want to start a company hmm? now if the reason is money you want money then you know there are specific kind of companies you can start or you can you can take up a particular job which will give you a lot of money if you want fame then there are specific kind of companies or certain in job professions you can take which will give you fame for example you can become you can try to get into media you know that will give you fame right? so i mean the question that you ask is what, what do people interestingly want and i don't know why people don't want to talk about this it's all very sensible choices men women want money power fame you know all the good stuff in life right you are here for a couple of decades you will die out right so might as well have joy you know whatever god has made available to the mankind but you have to be clear like what you want now when you want these thing you can't have all three because just very difficult to 
that so you basically kind of plan out like you say prioritize you say oh i want money more maybe power a little bit less and then fame even less you know even nobody knows me and i am kind of I'm wealthiest man i am very happy and you introspect and you say okay, this is what i want actually sacrifice fame you want you want to focus on one thing because that itself is difficult once you decide then you have other choices available you can take a job you can become politician you can go into media you know all those things this is entry really text takes you to starting company why a startup there are a whole bunch of other companies that you can start you know so let's say you say oh i want money money because of money reasons i want to start a company let's say that be the reason i want to be very wealthy person and then fame is maybe second for you so while i'm making money i want everybody to clap as well how amazing man i am if you're choosing that path you know there are various kind of companies you can do why start a new product you know become a microsoft or salesforce partner and most of people coming from technology background they'll do very well there are other franchises you can take when you're not taking product risk um, and you can get wealthy how much money do you need million dollar every year you know that will give you a very good life in india if you do decide to start a company the question that you should ask is if i want to make money do i want to be the founder or want to be co-founder with somebody else kind of doing it what you want to do is whatever you want you want to reduce the risk and the reduce the risk by picking up the right tool and right path to choose so that you are happy and you get what you want with the highest probability of happening it the doing a consumer startup the back angel startup <laughs> this for crazy people Mark Zuckerberg said no to a billion dollars, right? When Yahoo wanted to buy it. He's fighting with the U.S. government today, holding on to Facebook. These are, these are very different kind of people. Fortunately, most of the people are sane in the world. And think about in a very sane way, like what in your life, what is the priority? Money, power, fame, independence. And these are typical four things that I've seen. You know, if you want independence, maybe not starting a business is probably what a very bad idea because you are responsible for everyone. You have no free time for yourself. So I think people need to make the right decision. and pick up the right career option and not just blindly follow what everybody else is doing but if, if they do decide to become a founder of a venture back up very important for them to know who they are if this is what they will do whatever may happen they will go ram through concrete walls you know, are okay not seeing their family for months okay being miserable okay being not receiving any acknowledgement anybody saying you did a good job ever uh, everybody always complaining the working day and night um, and at the end of the day still not making enough money you know that is when they should do it i think a lot of founders also follow the thesis the problem with the thesis is that out of everybody who is doing it two or three will be successful you being in that group is very unlikely uh, just statistically right it's not nothing against that person so the thesis companies fail quite rapidly versus something that you strongly feel about and you see the logic that this is a large market you know this is stock opportunity is going to be there this is a differentiation is good stuff that end up happening so think deeply about the idea that that people work on besides of course trying to be a founder itself i mean it's, if it is fake right founding journey will figure it out very quickly believe me so that was amrish gupta taking us through his journey from the streets of kanpur to the mecca of management consulting to starting india's very first cloud telecom saas company and eventually settling in his current role of a private equity investor. The one thing that you should take away from this journey is that you should embrace failure because it really is the best teacher. If you like the Founder Thesis podcast, then do check out our other shows on subjects like marketing, technology, career advice, books, and drama visit the podium.in that is t h e p o d i u m .in for a complete list of all our shows